Hi class, welcome to Advantage. My name is Dr. Scott Adamson, and today we're gonna to explore an idea from calculus known as the product rule. So let's go back though to something that you are probably familiar with, and that is taking the derivative of a function using the power rule. So consider this function f of x, which is x to the one third power. You probably know that we can take the derivative of this function by bringing that exponent down front as a coefficient and then decreasing that power by one. And if you decrease one third by one, you'll get negative two thirds. And so we compute the derivative of, of f of x using the power rule. Or you also probably at this stage know that you can take the derivative of trigonometric functions. So consider the function g of x equals the sine of x. You might have rec uh, recalled and maybe even proved that the derivative of the sine of x is the cosine of x. But what I'd like you to uh, think about today is not these two functions individually, but what if we define another function, I'm gonna call it w of x, that happens to be the product of two functions. And in this example, suppose the first function is that x to the one-third function, and the second function is the sine of x. Now, I would ask you to just pause the video for a second right now and make a guess. How do you think the derivative of w of x should be? Or if you know already for some reason, go ahead and, and write it out, because what we're gonna explore today is why does that make sense? Now, a lot of people in just their first interaction with this, if they haven't actually already been instructed in some way about taking the derivative of a product of two functions, a lot of students think that the derivative is just what we did over here, but now a product. That is, the derivative of x to the one-third, which was one-third x to the negative two-thirds, gets multiplied by the derivative of sine of x, which is cosine of x. And what I would like us to consider here today is, is this true? And if so, why? And if not, why? So we were exploring the product of the function f of x, which was x to the one third power, and g of x, which is the sine of x. And so you'll see here on Desmos, I've got the product defined as w of x, and when we turn on that function, we can see what that function looks like, how it behaves, there's some really interesting features of this function that you'll see as we continue to explore its derivative. So first, I want you to think about what the derivative means. In one sense, we can think of the derivative as the slope of the curve at any point. To help you visualize that, I've created a little red tangent line here. So as I move the slider, I want you to pay attention to the slope of that red segment as x increases from about negative 10, and now here we are about negative eight. Do you see how that slope of that curve is going from pretty dramatically positive relative to the rest of the curve? And the slope is becoming less and less and less positive, and at the top of that maximum point there on that graph, we see that the slope would be zero. After which the slope turns to negative and becomes, again, relatively speaking, Pretty, pretty negatively sloped right in there around negative seven into negative six. But then as we reach the minimum of this green function, the slope again turns to zero, right around, oh, negative five or so. Again, the slope turns positive, getting very positive there in the middle between negative four, maybe around negative three. Slope of zero at that peak or that maximum value again. And then now look, around x equals zero, some interesting things happen. The slope just to the left of zero is pretty steeply negative. And then in just an instant, the slope flips to positive. And we can see that in when, we, when we examine the derivative later, but the slope now is really positive. And then again, as x increases towards two, the slope hits zero at that maximum negative once again to zero at the minimum around negative five, uh, positive five-ish, and then positive back to zero, et cetera. 
Now, as we think about those slopes or the rate at which this curve is changing as x increases, we can think about what the graph would look like that keeps track of those derivative values. And so I'm going to rewind that slider. And now let's keep track of the derivative graph. So here in purple, you will see that derivative function. Again, match the slope of the curve with the value of the derivative given there in purple. So we see those really steep positive slopes. Therefore, we're getting output quantities that are really positive. And then near that peak, the slope becomes closer and closer to zero. And the slope is actually zero right about there. x equals just shy of negative 8. And et cetera. That same thinking, but now look at the purple graph keeping track of those rate of change, those slope values as x increases. And we should see things that make sense, like the slope of zero right there. The slope of zero right there. And remember that place, uh, that instance at x equals zero, where the slope quickly changes from pretty steeply negative to positive very quickly. And we see the behavior of that derivative function right in there. And then those positive slopes become closer to zero, turning negative, again zero, turning positive, again zero, et cetera. So hopefully that purple graph is making sense to you in terms of how it's keeping track of the derivative function for that product uh, w of x. Now we made a conjecture on the board earlier that said maybe the derivative function is just the product of the two derivatives. And I'm pointing at that now, the derivative of x to the one third times the derivative of sine of x. Let's see if that function does indeed match the derivative function that we saw in purple. And you see, no, it does not. That idea of taking the derivative of a product by just taking the derivative of the two factors, the two functions, is not correct. That purple derivative graph and that orange, uh, orange function are not matching up whatsoever. And we can see why in just a couple of instances. Let me rewind my slider again. And we can see, for instance, right in here, the red slope of the curve is very positive as the purple derivative graph is showing, yet our orange conjectured derivative graph shows a negative output quantity. So that just can't be a derivative then. And we see that again as we just scroll through here, as my slider changes, we see that that orange graph is not tracking the derivative values like the purple one is. So there's got to be more to the story then. That conjecture derivative cannot be right, so what is it? Well, just to kind of highlight, if we just were not knowing what the derivative was at all, we could go back to our definition of derivative and say, what would we get if we graph w of x plus h minus w of x all over h? There is our definition of derivative. If I click on that graph, we see in black the derivative function. And as we do with derivatives, we want that h value, the limit as h goes to 0. And what we observe is, as h approaches 0, that derivative graph gets closer and closer and closer to that purple derivative function that we saw earlier. So what is that function in purple? What is that function in black that as h approaches 0, it gets closer and closer to that purple graph? What is that function? Well, we look here on my screen at the function p of x. The derivative function actually is this. It's x to the 1 third power. Remember, that was the first factor in w of x, in that product of the two functions. So the first factor in our derivative is that function x to the 1 third which gets multiplied by the cosine of x, that's the derivative of sine of x, plus, now we have sine of x, that from the original product function, just the sine of x, which gets multiplied by the derivative of the first factor, x to the one-third. Now I know you're thinking right now, well, what in the world, where does all that come from? Notice, we don't take the derivative times, we do take the derivative of the second factor, plus, we don't take the derivative of the second factor times we do take the derivative of the first factor. Why does that produce the derivative? 
Well, let's just check and make sure that it does. I'm going to click that on, and in red, you will see that derivative function. So yes, as h approaches 0, the derivative gets closer and closer and closer to that function that I just described. And I would like to explore, why does that crazy function become the derivative function of a product? Let's go find out. So as you saw on Desmos, this idea of taking the derivative of a product by just taking the derivative of the two function factors does not produce the correct result. And in fact, what does produce the correct result is this idea of take the first function, multiply it by the derivative of the second function, the derivative of sine of x is cosine of x, plus take the second function and multiply it by the derivative of the first function. But an intelligent human being should be asking the question right now, where did you get that from? Let's find out. So to make sense of this thing we call the product rule, why do we sometimes take the derivative and sometimes not and take the product and the sum and where does all of that come from? I'm going to ask you to kind of slow down your thinking here and follow along little bit by little bit as we build the product rule from the definition of derivative. So remember our original function, w of x, was the product of two functions. In our case, it was an x to the one third and a sine of x, but we're gonna do this in general for any two functions that happen to be multiplied together. Recall our definition of derivative is the limit as h goes to zero of w of x plus h minus w of x all over h. Let's apply that definition of derivative to this product up here. First, we'll take the limit as h goes to 0, w of x plus h. So we're going to input, instead of x, we're going to input x plus h, that little change in x. So f of x plus h times g of x plus h. And then minus the original function, which was that product, f of x times g of x. And then all of that gets divided by h. So we're just applying the definition of derivative to that w of x product, f of x times g of x. Now, on this next step, little history here. Somebody, maybe it was Isaac Newton, could have been Gottfried Leibniz, had been exploring this maybe for a long time. I don't know how long it took. But this next thing that you're going to see, don't anticipate that this would have happened historically in just an instant. It may have happened over many, many, many hours of work and effort and trial and error. I say that because here's what happens on the next step. So we have our f of x plus h gets multiplied by g of x plus h. And for reasons that you'll see in a minute, I'm going to leave myself a little bit of a gap before I write the minus f of x times g of x. And then all of this is going to get divided by h. The crazy thing that happened historically, and just through probably trial and error, trying to make things work out and simplify using mathematical thinking, is they added zero. Now, not literally add zero, but add something that represents zero. And the thing that represents zero in this case that you'll see is very useful is we're going to have a minus f of x plus h times g of x. And then we're going to add f of x plus h times g of x. Now, what I've done here is taken my definition of derivative, and right here, I've added a quantity, an expression that has a value of zero. Thus, not changing my expression, my limit definition, but allowing me to do some algebraic manipulations to prove this thing called the product rule. Here's how it goes. Now, what I'd like you to do is consider the first two terms together plus the second two terms together. By using the distributive property here, we're going to distribute that division of h. So we're going to have f of x plus h gets multiplied by g of x plus h. Subtract f of x plus h times g of x and divide all that by h. And then plus... These two terms also have to get divided by h by the distributive property. 
And also remember our limit as h approaches zero is applied to both of those terms now. Now, one last step and you will see this thing called the product rule emerge. And it emerges from just sort of a rearrangement, an algebraic rearrangement of our terms here. Okay, first of all, in this numerator, we have a common factor of f of, f of x plus h. Let's factor out f of x plus h. If I factor out f of x plus h, what remains is g of x plus h minus g of x, all divided by h. And similarly, over here, we have a common factor in this numerator of g of x. Let's factor out the g of x. So we'll have g of x times, if we factor out the g of x, we'll have f of x plus h minus f of x, all of that divided by h. And again, remember the limit as h approaches zero is applied to both of those terms. Now here's where we just have to recognize that definition of derivative again. As h approaches zero, g of x plus h minus g of x all divided by h, that's the definition of the derivative of g. And over here, as h approaches zero, f of x plus h minus f of x all divided by h, that's the definition of the derivative of f. So applying that thinking of the definition of derivative and h approaching zero, here's what we now have. As h approaches zero, f of x plus h will approach just f of x. g of x plus h minus g of x all over h, that's the definition of the derivative of g. Plus g of x. And then f of x plus h minus f of x all over h as h goes to zero is the definition of the derivative of f of x. And so then there it is. To get the derivative of that product, w prime, what we're gonna do is take the first function as it is, multiply it by the derivative of the second function, plus take the second function as it is and multiply it by the derivative of the first function. As you saw in Desmos and as you saw previously our work is confirmed by this proof. Now, you might have to take some time to think through that and maybe try working out those manipulations for yourself and making sense of it, but it is important to have a sense that these rules do come from some thinking and reasoning on the mathematics, not just out of thin air. I hope that helps you see where these things come from just a little bit.